I'm going to tell the perspective from me for the start, and then I will tell the give the actual deal in question from Michael Camel's perspective. Um, so, Michael, I mean, very strong player. Was he playing in this event? He was playing in this event. He was playing with Eric Robinson on that team, who got knocked out yesterday by... Leibowitz? I don't remember. They got knocked out yesterday, but Michael Camel was the pro that plays with the sponsor on a bunch of teams. And I was at a regional. I was playing with Craig on a sponsored team um, in Northern Northern Virginia. This would have been the Reston Regional, maybe in like 2014 or 2015. I don't remember exactly the year, but we were playing in a morning knockout. And... The other side of our bracket was the a team where Michael Camel was playing with John Kranjak, and their teammates were, I think, Joel Woldridge and a sponsor. I don't remember exactly, but that, that's kind of my guess. So sometime during the tournament, we um, ended up finishing our match early. I went to the hotel bar. I think it was mid-round, so I wasn't, like, planning on getting hammered before the next set. But I was, like, in the bar area waiting for someone in the hotel. And Michael Camel, I see him, like, walking down the stairs from the tournament area. There's the, there's this, like, staircase that leads, like, from the tournament down to the first level floor in the hotel. And the bar is on the first floor. Um, it's an open like open bar, not, not in the sense that like the bar itself is open. You can just get drinks and whatever, but like the area is open. It's not like you have to go into an establishment and that's where the bar is. You're, you're just like wide out in the open, hotel lobby, guests are checking in in one place, bar here, like hookers and blow over on the other side. Um, it's great. So I was sitting in that area and Camel walks down the stairs he makes eye contact with me. So he's just like, you know, I see you and starts booking it across the hotel lobby floor directly to me where I'm seated at the bar. He gets over to me. He's like half out of breath. And he's like, you won't guess what Cran just did to me. So I know that he's playing with Cran, and I'm like, oh no, what, what did this guy do again? Like, he's such a jokester. So this is the hand he picks up. Um, he picks up ace, king, queen, six, ace, third, singleton, king, third. He's in first seat, he's unfavorable, and of course, like any human being, he's playing two over one, he opens a spade. Great. So the auction proceeds... Um, as follows. Uh, two diamonds, two spades, five diamonds. So he goes into the tank, right? It's a team match. I mean, five spades could be making. Although, you know, he, he had, does have a diamond loser, partner bid only two spades. He might have three losers. He starts thinking and starts constructing some hands. And he's there for like three or four minutes. And then the auction concludes. There, there's no more bidding. Because what happens is the other table finished play... And both a uh, member from his team and the other team come over, pat him on the back, and they're just like, hey, we've conceded the match. Okay? And so Camel is just like, all right, cool. Uh, other team conceded, no problem. We don't have to play this hand out. We're all good. Shuffles up the cards, puts him back in the board, moves on. So that was at the morning. And when he had come up to me, it was like afternoon slash evening. Um, <laughs> at lunch, he goes out to lunch with his team. And at some point, he just can't shake the feeling like, I need to know if bidding five spades or doubling five diamonds was the right thing to do with this hand. So he, let me, let me get rid of this 
um, this thing. So what he does is he asks Cran, hey, Cran, what did you have on that last hand that we didn't get to finish? And Cran says, oh, I just had, a, I think, a seven count or maybe an eight count with uh, some spade support. Cool. So Michael's like, oh, OK, cool. No problem. Um, thanks for letting me know. But then <laughs> a bit later, he's up in his hotel room and he's th sitting around and thinking and, and goes, man, I I've constructed some like eight counts for Cran and it's still I really need to know because he had come up with the determination that he was going to bid five spades on this one. And, you know, that he has to know if he had done the right thing. So he goes up to Cran again and goes, OK, I, I really need to know what your hand was. And Cran says, well, you know, I, I, I did tell you I just had like a few values and some spade support. And he's like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like what values, you know, like were your values in hearts? Did you have a, a diamond shortness? Um, like how many spades did you have? Because you might have had four in this type of auction. And so Cran then tells him his hand. And this was Cran's hand. <laughs> so Cran, <laughs> on this deal, as we now reveal the full layout, has decided to walk the dog, so to say, with his five-card spade suit and diamond void, <laughs> figuring that the opponents are not going to be able to help themselves but bid a bunch of diamonds at this type of vulnerability. And, and so he's going to get a second chance to act. But before, before he had a chance to actually fully show his values, like this had to be completely unexpected to him, but it makes the story so much better because it put Michael through, um, through all this anxiety throughout, throughout the entire day, which... Cran, as a certified troll, uh, absolutely would do to his partner. Is <laughs> rather than making things easier on him, he would make things much, much more difficult um, when he knows it doesn't really matter. So <laughs> he just bid two spades with this hand, and I don't know if they were planning on getting to seven spades or not after this start to the auction. It would have been very amusing if they did, but <laughs> we'll never know because, <laughs> because Michael never had the opportunity to continue bidding out the hand.